Welcome to my session, What the Crack, Super Fast JVM Startup. My name is Gerrit Grunwald. I'm working for Azul as a senior developer advocate and I'm also the Java user group leader of the Jack Münster here in Germany. If you would like to have the slides afterwards, you can snapshot this QR code and then you will get a link or it will open in the browser directly so you can download it later on. I give you some seconds to take a snapshot. So, let's start. Java is great. We have a vibrant community. We have lots of Java user groups and we have thousands of free open source software projects. But the real star of the whole system is the Java virtual machine. The question is, how does it work? Well, let me give you a very simple overview on how it works because we will need that for our session. So we start with the Java source code file and this gets into the Java C compiler and it spits out a bytecode file which is the class file and this bytecode is cross-platform. That means if you have a JVM on your system you can load this class file and it will compile into the native machine code of this system where you loaded it from. So once we have this class file it gets into the class loader and the class loader loads the class file into the JVM memory. Of course, this is way more complex in reality, but for this session, it will be okay to keep it like that. So from the JVM memory, it gets into the so-called execution engine, which is a part of the JVM. <clears throat> and you can see that the execution engine is not only one thing, but it has multiple parts that we can see here. So let's take a closer look at them. So it starts with the interpreter, then we have the C1 JIT compiler, also formerly known as the client compiler. And then we have the C2 compiler, which is formerly known as the server compiler. And then there's also profiler and garbage collectors. Um, the two compilers are since JDK 8 now, uh, both part of the, of the execution engine at the same time, and they will be used in a so-called tiered compilation. And in this session, we only focus on the three first parts because this is not about profiling and garbage collecting. So we start with interpreting or bytecode from the class file line by line into the native instruction set of the CPU. And the JVM is profiling that, right? It's counting method calls and loopback edges. And when these pointers or these counters reach a specific threshold, the JVM will take the code the interpreted code, and then we'll forward it to the C1 compiler. The C1 compiler, formerly known as the client compiler, is made to compile very fast without doing a lot of uh, optimizations to the code, right? But then, so the target is to get as fast as possible to compiled code. So then, once again, this compiled code is now running, and the JVM is again profiling this compiled code, and again counting method calls and loopback edges. And when another threshold is reached, it will take this code and will forward it to the C2 compiler. Right? The C2 compiler is way more complex than the C1 compiler. And it's formerly known as the server compiler and it does a lot of optimizations, but it also takes a little bit longer because it's way more complex than the C1 compiler. But the code it compiled, the compiled code it spits out is way better than the code that is coming from the C1 compiler. So that leads me to the execution cycle. So we start with interpretation, which is slow. Then we profile this code when it's running. We figure out hotspots, <clears throat> which is also the name of the hotspot compiler. This is one of the reasons. Then we take this code, put it into the C1 compiler, which is very fast, but doesn't do a lot of optimizations. Then we profile it again, and afterwards, uh, we have the C2 compiled code, which is the best possible code we can get out of the JVM. Now you see another little arrow there, and this is called de-optimization. It could be a performance hit, but it is also one reason why the JVM, JVM is as fast as it is today. So let's take a look at the de-optimization. We have one simple method, and this method takes a value and then independent on this value, if, it's, if the, the value is larger or greater than nine, it will do some more calculation and, and give us back a value called bias, right? 
if the value is not larger than 9, uh, the bias will be 1, and then it will return the log 10 of the bias plus 99. This is the, the method. And now let's assume that while the JVM is profiling the running code, the value was never greater than 9. So it always ended up with bias equals 1. So what the JVM is now doing, it optimizes this method internally and it gets us something like this. So in case the value is greater than 9, we have a call to uncommon trap, right? But this is not, not for this one now. This is not the interesting part. The interesting part is that it directly sets the bias to 1 and then it calculates uh, matlock 10 of 1 plus 9.99. So you can optimize that further, right, in doing just this, just using matlock 10 from 100. And if you know the result of that, it's just 2. So that means the whole code is now just return 2. And you can imagine that this is way faster than doing the if-then uh, calculation and, and uh, using a new variable. <clears throat> so now in case the value is greater than 9, then the JVM will call the uncommon trap, which means this code is not valid anymore. And it has to throw away the whole complete code, the optimized code, and then go back to the original version and do an optimization for the whole method, not only for one part, right? Because now we, it knows both uh, um, uh, equations of this um, if-then clause could happen. And so in this case, it has to optimize both. But you can see this optimization, which is called branch prediction, can give us a huge benefit in performance. And that's going on at runtime. So this is, um, and this is the reason why we need the optimization sometime. So, what does it mean? If we take a look at the performance graph, then we see three different colors here. We see the, the yellow one, which is the interpretation phase, phase, the green one, which is the C1 phase, and the C2 is the blue one, right? So as I said, interpretation in the beginning, then it goes to the C1 <coughs> compiling profiling, and then it goes to the C2 code, and then this code gets faster and faster until it reaches um, the best performance possible. Then we see these gaps in this blue area. For example, on the right side, we see this periodic gaps, and this is usually garbage collection process, right? Where the performance drops shortly <clears throat> for the garbage collection, then it goes back to the speed. But then we see these big gaps in the beginning, and this is the optimization. So you see the JVM optimized the code, and then it was already fast, and suddenly it drops, goes back to interpretation because the, the code was not valid anymore, and then it has to go back through interpretation C1, C2 until it gets fast again. So we see these drops uh, in the beginning in the ramp up phase right, of the performance. So if we take a look at the JVM startup in general, then we have to make a distinction between different cases, right? Because people usually say, ah, oh, the JVM is just slow when it starts up, which is not really true. <clears throat> so you can prove it if you just create one class with one method and just may do system out print line hello world and then start it up and tell me it's slow it will it will start up pretty fast so that means the jvm itself starts up in milliseconds because there's not a lot of stuff to do right it gets something to do when it loads your classes so your code makes the startup slow which is obvious because it has to be interpreted compiled optimized and so on so that means if we talk about jvm startup <coughs> we usually count the JVM startup itself plus the application first time to respond, right? So this is usually what we define as the JVM startup time. And then there is another one, which is called JVM warm-up. Because you can imagine, just because your application comes back the first time doesn't mean it's now totally optimized at the best performance level. It takes some time because you have to touch a lot of code in your application to optimize everything <clears throat> and this is this totally depends on your application right so it can take seconds minutes hours it can take days it depends really on your application so that means this is jvm warm-up jvm warm-up includes jvm startup application initialization plus the warm-up of your application right so after uh, application or jvm warm-up <clears throat> your application is at the highest possible performance okay just to keep that in mind, if people talk about JVM startup is slow, well, you have to know how it works. So, that's all great, right? 
but um, as you already saw, it takes time. So if we take this now into microservice environments that we find these days quite often, what does it mean? That means the first time you start up your service, it has to go through interpretation C1, C2, until it reaches full performance. Second time you start it, same thing. Third time you start it, again. So that means uh, not very good, right? Because every time you start up your service, the JVM has to go through the whole phase because it doesn't have any memory. Means you start it once, <clears throat> it doesn't have optimizations, when you shut it down and you start it again and has to do the optimizations again. Hmm. Wouldn't it be great if we can do something like this? You start it up once, the second time you start it, it's at full performance level, third time you start it, full performance level, so always you start it after the first start, it would be at full speed. That would be great. So do we have maybe some solutions already? <clears throat> Let's take a look. There's first of all something called Clase Data Sharing, which is not really related to compiling and interpretation, but still it improves the startup of your JVM. So what it does is it takes a, a representation of your class files and put them all in one file. Instead of loading all these classes from different places, it then loads it once, stores all the information in a specific format in one file. The next time you start it up, it can just load this one file, which is much faster than just loading all the different files, right? You can do that for JVM level and also for application level. And um, there is no optimization or hotspot detection here because this is all class loading time, only class loading time. But it can improve your startup by two seconds if you're lucky. And if you would like to know more about it, then you can check out this blog post from Ionit Balusin which is really great because he explains in detail how you can tune the CDS uh, to make your application start up faster. And by the way, CDS is per default enabled since JDK 12. So that means if you're running on JDK 17, you, you use that already. But still you can tune it to make it faster. Okay, and it happens here, just to make sure that you know where we, what we are talking about. It's not really interpretation, compilation or something else. It's really just loading classes, okay? So then we have ahead of time compilation. You probably heard of that. And um, the advantage is we don't have to interpret bytecodes here. And there's also no analysis of hotspots and no runtime compilations of code. And we can start up with full speed straight away, right? And Cryo Native Image does exactly this. So, okay, that, that's all we need, right? Well, not so fast. Because AOT is by definition static. So that means the code is compiled before it is run. All right? So it's not just in time compilation, it's ahead of time compilation, whereas, which is a big difference. Right? That means the compiler has no idea when it compiles the code how the code will actually use later on, how it will run, right? So you can fix it a little bit by using so-called profile guided optimization where you run the code once, you create a profile and then you apply the profile to the native image afterwards. Then it is optimized for one specific use case. If the application will be used in a different way, the optimization won't work, right? So this is, um, but you can use it, right? So not in every versions of GraalVM available, but it is, uh, it is there. So if we take a look at the performance graph again and now try to apply it to the um, native or let's say AOT approach, then it would be without PGO, you can get up to 60% maybe of the speed of a JVM because the compiler can just take the code and compile it up front, right? If you use PGO, you can get higher speeds, maybe up to 90% of the JIT, but it's still optimized for one specific use case, right? And the other thing is that if you use AOT compiled code and you would like to make sure you have a native image, it should run on all, let's say, all Intel hardware versions, then you have to make sure that it only supports uh, these kind of features in the CPUs that are also available in the, let's say, older CPU architectures, right? So you have, for example, Haswell, and then you have Ice Lake and Sky Lake and all these, and they are not compatible. So that means um, the latest versions of Intel's uh, CPUs 
have abilities that haven't been available in the older ones to make sure that your code runs on all these platforms. You have to make sure that you only use these features that are available even in the older ones. So that means you can't really optimize it to the latest CPU level, right? Okay. So, and like I said, for PGO, you need to do a profiling run before that. Okay, I found a quite interesting um, comparison between the JVM and the AOT native images, and that was on uh, beldung.com. You see the link here. If you follow the QR code, you can check it out on your own. And the interesting part wa was that in this blog post, Spring Boot and Quarkus have been compared not only on JVM level, but also the native images that they produced. And the interesting part is that, of course, the startup time was with the native image way faster than uh, with the JVM. That's not really a surprise. But on the other hand, the throughput was way slower when you use native images. <clears throat> you can see it here, um, for example, for the Spring Boot application, <clears throat> it dropped from 100% of the JIT to 74% in the native image. And with Quarkus, it dropped from 100% for the JIT to 53% in the native image. So that means, yes, you gain startup time, which is way faster, but then you get a drop in performance. Hmm. So that means if you would like to have the same performance, in this case, you have to double the CPU <coughs> in the cloud, for example, to make it work. Hmm. So that's, that's also a drawback, right? So if we do a quick comparison between AOT and JIT, <coughs> you will see that the AOT can't really uh, use <coughs> method inlining aggressively at runtime, not at all, only be beforehand, right? So the JIT can do that all the time. And uh, there's no runtime uh, bytecode generation in AOT. Uh, reflection is possible in AOT, but it's hard because uh, if you would like to do <coughs> the reflection in AOT compiled code, then you need to know exactly what classes will be called uh, in your application. So you need to know the whole world at compile time. Where the JIT can do that even at runtime. You can load dynamically code and then compile it at runtime, right, and optimize it. Uh, you can use speculative optimizations in the JIT, but you can't do that uh, in the AOT because speculative optimizations means it's optimizations at runtime and AOT is ahead of time compiled code, so there is no runtime compilation here. Um, as already mentioned, the CPU architectures, uh, you have to keep them in mind when you do native images because you have to cover all the different versions means you really need to go for the least common denominator here. Um, the biggest problem that I see with, uh, with AOT compiled code is that you leave the Java world, right? You step into the native world. That means you create your code in, a, in an IDE in Java, you test it in Java, and then you compile it, and then you run it as native image. And native code is not the same as Java code. And debugging native code is also totally different from debugging Java code. Native code can even behave differently, right? So this is could be a pr problem. Debugging native images is not really easy. Um, typically, overall performance, um, as we saw, is usually higher in the JIT than an IoT compiled code. Well, of course, it doesn't have only uh, disadvantages. The startup time is way faster in, uh, in AOT compiled code, and uh, we don't have any overhead um, at startup because we don't have to compile code at startup, where the JIT has to do that. And the memory footprint is, of course, smaller because the AOT code only contains the, all the classes that actually will be called later on, where if you have the JIT, then you load a library. Even if you just use one class out of that library, it will load the whole thing and compile it, right? So this is uh, also a difference. The memory footprint is bigger in the JVM. Okay, so that means JVM disadvantages, or the JIT disadvantages here, it, it requires more time to start up, uh, CPU overhead to compile code at runtime. Of course, we run the code and at the same time, time we compile it and optimize it so it takes more CPU and we have a larger memory footprint. Hmm. Okay, so let's take a look at a different approach here. There's a project called Creo, which is Checkpoint Restore in User Space. And it's a Linux project. It is uh, part of the kernel since 2013, so that means it's already 10 years part of the kernel, quite mature. And it was made to freeze a running container or application on Linux 
checkpoint um, the state to disk and then restore from the checkpoint later on from that saved data back into memory. Right? So it's already used or integrated in OpenVZ, Linux containers, Docker or Podman and um, it heavily relies on the uh, PROC file system so that means you need to have the PROC file system in Linux to make it work. So there are Linux distributions that don't have PROC so um, there you can't use uh, Creo and as you already see Creo is only available on Linux. It's not available on Mac and Windows but we will come to that later on. So it can checkpoint lots of different things. And just to make clear what checkpoint restore means, uh, probably all of you know that already. So if you have a laptop and you work on the laptop the whole day and in the evening you just shut down the lid uh, without closing the applications, uh, you, you can just do it, right? You just shut it and then you go to bed. Next morning after breakfast, you start again, you just open it and bam. All your applications are there and they're in the same state as the evening before when you left it. So that is checkpoint restore. So the operating system detects, oh, it's closing the lid. I save all the state to the disk and the next morning you open it and says, oh, there is a checkpoint on the disk. I just reload from that checkpoint back to memory. And that's pretty fast, right? It's usually faster than starting all applications again. Okay, this is checkpoint restore. Creo was made for that to, to do that um, on application level on the Linux operating system. And as you can see, it can checkpoint lots of different things. And it can also rebuild TCP connections just from one side without handshaking, which is also interesting. It doesn't come without challenges though. So if we take a look at it, then it means if you create a checkpoint on one machine and you would like to restore on another machine, it means you, you can create the checkpoint on one machine, save the files, take the files, copy it to a second machine and try to restore it on this machine. You might run into problems. First of all, you have to make sure it's the same CPU architecture, right? So you can't just use it, uh, create a checkpoint on an Intel machine and then restore it on an ARM machine. Won't really work. Totally different architecture, totally different code. Um, the other thing is that if you have open files on one machine, they don't have to be necessarily on the other machine, right? So and these kind of problems or shared memory, this could be problematic. So this is not so easy to solve. Uh, the other one is that you can't really start the same instance or restore from the same um, checkpoint multiple times at the same time. And the reason for that is that the PID, which is the process ID, which is unique on Linux, is just part of this checkpoint. So it means if you restore from the from the checkpoint and you have your application running again, then you just can't restore again because this PID is already taken, so it won't work. And the third thing is that taking a JVM, and you might think, oh, the JVM is just a, an application running on Linux, so I can just checkpoint and restore it. Well, yes, the application uh, itself, so the JVM itself, Probably you could do that, but your pr the problem that we have is that it's the JVM and inside of the JVM you start your application and your application has the connections to a database, your application has a file open where it reads and writes to. So if you now checkpoint this, that means you close everything, then your application has no idea. So you have the checkpoint on the disk, you restore it again, the JVM will be started, your application will start and the first time it will try to access the database then BAM! It will crash because the database connection, connection is gone, right? So this is exactly the problem that we have. And that leads me to crack, which is coordinated restore a checkpoint. And the idea is to coordinate exactly this moment where we create a checkpoint and where we restore from a checkpoint, right? So that means Crack tries to solve the problem to let your application know that now there is a checkpoint that gives you as a developer the ability to do something before the checkpoint happens. Then the checkpoint will happen and when you restore it before really the application will fully start up we will give you the opportunity to do something in your application. In this case for example restore the database connection before your application starts running again. This is the, the idea behind Crack. Okay, so it comes with a pretty simple API, right? So it can create checkpoints using either code or J command. 
and um, it throws checkpoint exceptions in case something went wrong so you, you get a notification or exception so that you will figure out oh um, there was a mistake or I forgot to close something for example the database connection and uh, just to, to make that clear because people sometimes ask okay how can you make sure if you have a multi-threaded application that you stop all the threads and then uh, do something well we use the JVM save point mechanism and this is the same that is used for doing garbage collection pauses. So that means if there's a garbage collection pause, you never really stop some threads, right? The JVM can just do it. And we use the exact same mechanism because we know how the JVM works. So this is not really so hard. So you don't have to worry about that. And uh, we added two uh, command time parameters. First, uh, the one is that if you start your jar file, let's say you have a fat jar, and then you started with the java minus jar command then you have to add minus double x colon crack checkpoint two equals and then you can set a path or you have to set a path and this path is in principle the um, the hint for the jvm that in case there is a checkpoint the jvm needs to know where to store the checkpoint right so and this is the, the path where it should store the checkpoint could be a volume in a cluster if you like could be a local drive whatever Right? And if you would like to restore from a checkpoint, you just call java minus double x colon crack restore from. And then you point it to the folder where you have stored your checkpoint. And then it will automatically start back from that checkpoint back into memory. Okay, so crack is an OpenJDK project. So uh, you can find it at openjdk.org slash project uh, slash crack. It's, uh, it was invented by Azul. And it's led by one of our engineers named uh, Anton Kozlov. He's responsible for everything. He leads the project. So if you would like to figure out more about it, you can check out uh, this link. And now let's take a look at the, the API because it's, it's so simple. It's just one interface called resource. And this interface only has two methods, before checkpoint, after restore, which is quite self-explaining, right? So that means these resources can be notified by the JVM in case of a checkpoint or in case of a restore, right? So the classes and application code implement this interface where it's needed and you only need it, uh, for example, if you have files open or you have classes that, like a database manager, that would be preferably a class where you implement this interface. And then uh, this, your application receives callbacks from the JVM uh, when checkpointing and restoring, right? So that makes it possible for you to close resources before a checkpoint and after a restore to reinitialize these resources, right? So this is the main idea. Okay, so I, I already mentioned that you have to implement the interface and to make sure that the JVM can notify these classes, you have to register your interface in the JVM and, and in a so-called context, right? And the context you can get it by get calling core get global context. So that means you have your database manager, you implement the interface and the methods, and then you register this database manager into the global context to make sure that the JVM can notify the class, right? This is the main idea. Usually you do that in the constructor of the class, the registration of this. And yeah, so this is in principle how it works. You implement the interface, in your class, then you get the context and uh, register your interface or your resource in that global context. Okay, so creating a checkpoint um, can be done in different ways. I already mentioned that. So you can either do it from the command line and there you can use the J command and you can then either use the name of your jar file, so like your awesome.jar and with the command jdk.checkpoint or you can call the, the pit that this is what you would usually do in a containerized environment. That means J command, the pit, and then jdk.checkpoint. And this will trigger the checkpoint mechanism in the JVM. And the next thing that you can do, you can also use it from code. So in your code, you can create a checkpoint. And, but keep in mind, the JVM will shut down afterwards. We have a flag to keep it running, but usually the behavior is shut down everything right so this is the main idea so that means you could do in your code you could do something like if this folder is empty then create the checkpoint if it's not empty then don't do it stuff like that for example yeah you can do uh, checkpointing from code 
Okay, the big question is when to checkpoint, right? So um, what we do, um, because we just create the demos, um, we start our application with this flag, uh, minus double x colon plus print compilation, and it, this does exactly what it says. It prints out all the compilations on the console while the application is running. And then you apply a typical workload to your application and you will see it's, it's scrolling and scrolling because it shows all the compilations going on. But at one point you will see that there is a drop in number of compilations per second, let's say like this. And so you see if it gets slower and slower and then suddenly there's, there are not a lot of uh, compila compilations going on anymore, then it's a good time to create a checkpoint. Right? That's what we do. Um, you can also run, for example, all your tests um, and apply them to your application to make sure every method was tested and warmed up. You can use typical workload if you have something like that. Um, it, it all depends, but you have to make sure to touch as much code as possible before you create a checkpoint to make sure everything is completely warmed up. That means uh, best possible performance. To give you a short recap, an overview on cra how Crack works, we have the JVM. Inside the JVM, it starts up, it has your application loaded. In your application, you have, for example, classes that implement the interface with the two methods before checkpoint, after restore. Then you register these resources in the JVM in the global context. Then you warm up your application by applying some typical workload. And then you create the checkpoint, let's say JD, J command JDK dot checkpoint. What then happens is the JVM inf notifies your resources that you have registered and it will call the before checkpoint method. So here you can now close resources like open files or database connections, something like that, all kinds of socket connections. And then the application closes uh, open resources, right? This is up to you. Then the JVM will store the checkpoint uh, to the disk and then you can wait some time or deploy it somewhere. And the next time you start it up, uh, calling this Java minus X uh, crack restore from, right? So then the JVM doesn't have to do anything like um, class loading, application warm up, because this is all saved in the, in the checkpoint, right? So the only thing that happens is JVM starts up, it notifies your resources and specifically the after restore method. You can restore um, or reopen uh, resources that you need, like a database connection or like files, and then everything's running again, right? This is the idea. Um, the typical usage of Crack is probably you run your app in a, in a Docker container or in some kind of container, and then you create the checkpoint. You can either store the checkpoint inside of the container, or you can store it somewhere on a volume or on a, on a different drive or wherever. So which is more the preferred way? Because if you store it inside of the container, you have to change the image, right? So which is not, uh, you usually won't do that. But um, if you do that, then you have to commit the new state of the container, of course, because now it contains the, uh, the checkpoint. And then if you start the container again, you instead of starting up Java minus jar, you just call Java minus double X colon crack restore from and point it to the, to the checkpoint. Could be also in a volume in a cluster, right? So which is pre the preferred way because you would save some time in uh, some space in your, um, in your Docker images because it only contains uh, the JVM and your application and not the checkpoint. The checkpoint could be somewhere in a cluster or in the network drive. I already said that it's Linux only. It's available for Intel architectures, x64, and also ARM, which is ARC64, but only Linux. So what about Windows and Mac? Well, we have a solution for that, which is called org.crack. This is a library, and it is uh, designed to provide a smooth uh, crack adoption. Um, if you run it at compile time, it's a complete mirror of jdk.crack, which is the packages that comes with the JDK. Um, and then if you, if you have a JDK that doesn't support um, crack, no problem. You can just code against this library, everything's fine. 
there won't be any exceptions like package not found or something like that even if your JVM doesn't support crack because you code against the library right org.crack in case of a runtime <clears throat> so the crack will detect via reflection if the JVM uh, supports crack and then it will run uh, it will call every um, every method that will be called in the org.crack will be forwarded to the jdk.crack code that means it will use the crack code then so that means you can code on a windows machine or on a mac against org.crack and then you can deploy it on a on a cluster somewhere in a cloud environment where you have a linux and you run for example as zulu which supports crack and then it will figure out oh there's crack and it will use it uh, this is the main idea and if it does if you have a jdk that doesn't support crack it won't do anything at all so you can just run it but it won't call the methods Okay, you can get uh, the dependency. You can just add the library as a dependency and here are the, the code snippets for Gradle or Maven, if you like. And uh, this is also open source. It's available under github.com slash crack slash org.crack. And you can see what's in the code. It's, it's not a secret. And you can also um, try to participate if you like. So you're always welcome to do that. Okay, so now I already mentioned that with the IoT code and we have the same problem going on um, for snapshots or checkpoints because compatibility is or could be a problem. So first of all, if you would like to do an upgrade, so that means you create a checkpoint on a Haswell machine, then you can restore that on an Ice Lake machine. Because uh, the Ice Lake is a newer one, it will support all the older optimizations that have been available in Haswell. The way around, it won't work out of the box because Ice Lake um, has more possibilities to optimize code or different ones than Haswell. So that means if you have a checkpoint with optimized code uh, for Ice Lake, it won't, will probably not run on Haswell. We are working on a solution to give you the opportunity to say something like, optimize the code or only use the, the stuff that is available even on older architectures. In principle, the same approach that the AOT code uh, is doing. Okay, so usually why I mention that is if you, uh, in a cloud environment, let's say Azure, you can have node groups and in that node groups, you can define the CPU architecture and the cloud environment will make sure that in this node group, every node will exactly have the same CPU architecture. So you have to make sure that you do use this one. And the other thing is that if you run now in a Kubernetes cluster, you can run different node group groups in one cluster, and that's a problem. So you can have a, a node group uh, running on ARM and a node group running on uh, x64 Haswell, and you can run them in a Kubernetes cluster. So you have to make sure that the CPU architecture is the same when you restore it. So that means the checkpoint and the restore has to be done on the same CPU architecture, okay? Um, in virtualized environments, as long as the CPU architecture is the same, you can create a checkpoint, for example, in a Docker image uh, on Linux, and then you can run that in Docker on Windows if it's an x64 machine. So that works, I tried that already. Um, and now it's time for a little demo just to give you an idea so i created some kind of a name service and this name name service at startup loads 258,000 names from a json file uh, you will never do that in production this is really just for the demo and it sh should just show um, stuff that you have to do at startup usually when you start up your application you have to do all kind of things and in this case we load this file to memory so then it returns five random names for girls and five random names, names for boys and that's the whole service right pretty simple and then we measure the time to first response that, that's what we do so this is the the code that is called at startup the first time before we do the checkpoint you see i implemented the resource interface then i registered this class in the global context and then i call the init method and you see in the init method, I will load all the names from that file. And afterwards, I just create the random names. So this is the, the stuff we have to do. So that means start up, register, load the names, create the random names and put it out. That's everything. Okay, if we take a look at the uh, after restore method. So if we come from a checkpoint, then you see that the only thing we have to do is 
the random names because the stuff or all the names have been loaded already and then we created the checkpoint and the checkpoint is really like a snapshot of the JVM including your application means also all the data and in this case means all the names right so they are already loaded I don't have to load them I just start the JVM and I can directly run my code right so and you can already imagine it should be much faster okay let's take a look we have two shell windows on the left side we have the standard so it means uh, we started up normally and on the second uh, we just uh, restore it from a checkpoint you also see uh, the different ways I called it so uh, the second time I really instead of calling Java minus jar I directly called it with Java minus double X crack restore from and pointed to the folder where I would like to load my checkpoint from okay so this is the result and you see on the left side that it took around what was it uh, 1.3 seconds nearly to load the names from the JSON file on the right side you see we don't have to load the, the names and that means the first uh, the time to first response on the left side was 1.3 seconds because it includes the the loading time that means your initialization of your application on the second I didn't have to I really just can start it and then the startup time was 48 milliseconds and this is in the range of uh, native images right so this is the main idea if you would like to play around with this demo you can find it uh, on github here's the link to it this is just the, the most simplest example but it gives you an idea and it shows you you can directly use it right so this is just something to play around with okay the most important part of course these days is framework support because nobody really writes his own complete application without any framework usually people use something like Micronaut um, you know, whatever Spring Boot, Spring, Quarkus, something like this so and if this frameworks would support crack it would help a lot right so lucky you uh, Micronaut already has really good support for crack so that means if you use for example a JDBC connection Micronaut will figure out that if you use it with crack it will figure out oh in this class you use a JDBC connection and there is a checkpoint I will shut it down for you and I will restore it afterwards so that means you don't have to do anything the framework will take care about it in Quarkus it's more simple uh, support at least they support the resource interface so that means you can uh, make use of that but you have to do a lot of stuff on your own but at least it's possible and in spring it will get full support for crack with the next version 6.1 end of this year and that means spring boot will also get it so there are good times ahead right okay so now I showed you all this stuff and I told you wow it's so cool but how good is it really of course we did some tests with, with real applications so we tweaked the Spring Boot application and a Micronaut Quarkus and we also did some XML transform just because it took some time to start up and here you see the time to first operation so the JVM startup as we define it and the Spring Boot application took uh, 3.9 seconds roughly uh, Micronaut was around one second Quarkus more or less the same and XML transform was 4.3 seconds time to first response so this is standard open JDK distribution uh, without any optimizations right so if we created a checkpoint and then we restored the same stuff from the checkpoint and measured the time to first response then this was the result and you can see that this was way faster than before and this is in the range of native image startup time plus you keep the JVM right so that means the code afterwards can be further improved right and you decide when to do the checkpoint it's up to you you make the decision now everything is perfectly optimized now I create the checkpoint or you say oh I would like to just get rid of the startup time uh, in the beginning and then you do it in main right you can decide when to do the checkpoint the reason why the, uh, the startup time after the checkpointing so after the restore is more or less the same for all of these different applications is that this is only relying on IO it just has to load it back from the SSD into memory and if you have fast SSDs then this is all it needs right and it doesn't matter how long the first startup and warm-up took because once it's compiled and optimized it's really just loading back into memory and this is blazingly fast okay so as a summary crack is a way to pause and restore JVM based application it doesn't require 
a closed world as we have to do that with native images, right? So it's extremely fast to full performance level. Uh, there's no need for hotspot uh, identification, method compiles, recompiles, and deoptimizations because this is done before you do the checkpoint, right? So you optimize everything, then create the checkpoint. Afterwards, no need to really do more. Um, we have improved throughput directly from the start. It's an open JDK project and it can even save you some infrastructure cost. Let's take a short look at that one. You probably know this. Right, so on the y-axis we have the CPU utilization and on the x-axis we have the time. What you see in cloud environments quite often is that in the startup phase you see this peak in the CPU utilization and then it drops and then it levels out maybe at 50 or 40 percent whatever. So what this is is that this is the JVM startup time and this is the interpretation and compilation overhead in the beginning. Once this is done, right, so the, the application doesn't need all the CPU power anymore to run. So imagine you create a checkpoint here and then you start the next time from there. You just need half of the CPU in this case to get the same performance because this, the 100% only have been needed to get rid of this peak in the beginning, right? So this can really save some money right? because it eliminates the startup time and the CPU overhead at start. So if you would like to know more, feel free to check out github.com slash crack. There's everything, all the demos, all the code, the project lives on GitHub, so you can see what we are doing, so that's no secret. And um, you will also find builds there, which are just from time to time of the JDK to, to make sure you can test it. <clears throat> but we also, as Azul, have our own JDK, which is called Zulu, which is a build of OpenJDK. It's free even for production, so you don't have to pay for it. And this comes now with support for Crack. And this is a fully supported version. So that means it's not something like a better version or we try it or something like that. So you can download this one. You can use it in production for free with Crack. We don't charge you anything. And supported version, what does it mean in this case? <clears throat> it means, like I said, this is not an early access version or pre-build, right? So it, it will get updates from 1709, 10, 11. It will get uh, support in JDK 21. <clears throat> and uh, if you have commercial support uh, at Azul, we will also support you with Crack. So that means if you're a customer of, of ours and you have a support contract, you will get also support for Crack. Hot fixes, patches, all these kind of things. We support x64 and arc64. So that means you can also run it uh, on the latest ARM um, CPUs in AWS, if you like. Um, it would be possible to backport to JDK 8 and 11, but we would only do that if there is a high demand. So we, we won't just do it for the fun of it, because now 17 is out, 21 will come next month or this month. So that means um, if only if there's a good reason, we will uh, port it back to other JDKs. And with this, I just say thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of the conference.